Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest. Thanks for joining us. This week, I have a conversation with Kyle Kingsbury. Kyle is someone I met uh, through Aubrey Marcus's Fit for Service program. And uh, he's a really sweet guy. He's a former former uh, mixed martial arts fighter doing the whole MMA thing. And he's part of a crew of amazing men that I've met who are essentially warriors and fighters <laughs> whose hearts are exploding and opening. And they have been for a long time. I mean, first time I met Kyle, he was, um, it was when I was down to do Aubrey's podcast the first time in Austin. And the morning after, before I flew out, Aubrey said I'd come work out at their gym at On It. And I walk in the gym and he introduced me to Kyle. And of course, he's got no shirt on and he's doing some exercise. Uh, and I felt like a little string bean in there, but he was the sweetest guy. And we got to know each other a bit better when uh, I came down and performed for the Fit for Service folks. So I've been on his podcast and he's got a very prolific, wonderful podcast you can check out if you want to hear our conversation on that. But I was really happy to be able to bring him on board for the 10 Laws podcast. So that's what you're going to hear today. A big announcement uh, this Wednesday, so that would be December 16th, 2020, the tickets are now on sale. We've finally been able to nail down and announce the venue, which is Salt Palace in, uh, in Salt Lake City on January 16th. Let me just verify that date. That's going to be the date of our uh, East Forest Ceremony concert. Yeah, January 16th. So it's happening. This is our, this is our big attempt we are doing a COVID safe event in the midst of COVID uh, in a very, very large space with people spread out. You have to wear masks. That's a good idea. And it's also the legal requirement, among other things. So if you want to learn more information, go over to eastforest.org slash tour and click on the ticket link and you'll see all the information about the event. You can select your seat in this sort of mandala like uh, floor seating pattern because you're, you know, you're on the so you can lie down during this concert. Um, there's some VIP tickets where you get a, to keep the hugger mugger yoga mat that they're providing as well as get preferred seating. And then there's a uh, general admission tickets too, where you still get to pick your spot. And you, we're also going to be filming this event for the micro micro series that I'm producing in 2021, sort of this online, sort of a mixture of podcast and ceremony. So we're going to include clips from that, uh, or break it up into four sections for this series. So you'll also get uh, admission. You won't have to buy a ticket for the Micro Micro series. This ticket would cover that. So if you're in the area and you're feeling called to attend, please join us, get your ticket uh, quickly because it is a limited capacity event. And if you feel safe traveling by car or however you feel, if you want to walk, come join us, uh, eastforest.org. Hit the tour button and you'll learn more about that East Forest Ceremony concert on January 16th. I uh, just want to say thank you for everyone who's given this podcast a review and they given it just the five stars is really awesome on Apple Podcasts or if you're listening on Spotify or Stitcher or whatever. Thank you for sharing it. If you have a, an episode you like, just letting other people know about it so we can help this community grow. And also thanks for everyone who's been buying merch. We My dad is shipping it out. So, uh, I you know, could still get there for the holidays or a New Year's gift, but it's a great way to show your support for the podcast. And you can say hi always at info at eastforest.org or eastforest on Instagram, eastforest music on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, I just had my friend Steve-O here in, in Boise. We both got COVID tests so he could come for about four or five days and help me do some studio upgrades. He's, he's sort of my IT tech friend that I feel I have on retainer basically and because <laughs> I need his help and he also shot like a video for one of the songs for uh, the possible album that's what I'm calling it that's coming out hopefully in early 2021 so that was kind of fun getting in here and we took everything apart and basically put it back together again shot a video and just trying to help get my stuff streamlined I've also got my whole setup going here to practice live for the January 16th event with the grand piano and my live rig. And I'm just diving back into that mindset. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a while since I've 
we've been doing the virtual uh, ceremony concerts, which many of those, by the way, are still on YouTube if you want to check those out. But as far as getting in that flow of doing things uh, on tour in person, uh, getting that and, and basically doing my calisthenics. So uh, really excited to connect energetic with everybody energetically in person. And uh, by the way, Rada, my partner, she also released a meditation album on Spotify and Apple. It's called Guidance. And if you, her artist name is Marissa Rada Wepner. If you want to check that out, I, um, I mixed it and mastered it for her. And it includes East Forest music uh, because I love her and I want it to be awesome. And it is. It sounds amazing and she's awesome. So there's a yoga nidra there and uh, three meditations in all. So check it out. Uh, guidance, Marissa Rada Wepner, wherever you listen to music. Okay, friends, let's dive into this conversation with my good friend Kyle Kingsbury. Brightness in the world, but it's pitch black. Words from the savior, love your neighbor is intact. Some out of translation, getting lost in the syntax. Kyle Kingsbury, nice to see you. Good to see you too, brother. How is uh, new fatherhood going still? How fresh is it? It's uh, she just had. She's about four months right now. Oh my so, god. Um, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. You know, bear, bear was five when we had her and he's our, he was our only child. And it's like, he f- I forgot, you know, I forgot all the, uh, <laughs> forgot what the whole thing's like, <laughs> yeah, the stages, the whole deal. I have to keep you alive. Like the feeling like right when I caught her, cause we did a home birth, I was like, yay, she's here and she's healthy and holy oh, shit. Wow. I got to keep you alive right now. Yeah. So it's, it's been cool. She's, she's, super smiley and and outgoing and uh she's rolling around learning how to crawl and it's just fun you know each stage like that because they're they were spaced so far apart it's been beautiful to to get that it's almost like a first first time all over again yeah so you're that's crazy at a home birth i've never i've never done a birth not that i would have anything to do much with it but i uh I just feel like that's a beautiful thing to do, but it also seems there might be some inherent challenges to doing that at home. I hate apologize for my naivete, but how do you do that? <laughs> like, well, there are there are. I mean, for the listeners and for yourself, more more children in the world today, right now in 2020, are born at home or with midwives than in hospitals. So okay. still to this day right now, that's the the majority of the way we got here. And certainly we haven't had people in white lab coats birthing us for the the uh, the length of humanity. But um, we had Bear at Stanford and they were great. But, you know, giant fluorescent lights. We had to share a room with a premature baby, a preemie. And it wasn't because Tosh did it naturally and, and got him out fairly quickly. You know, her labor lasted but once we were in the hospital she was there for an hour we checked in at 10 p.m 1102 bear was in my arms so knowing how easy that i mean it's not easy i don't want to downplay it but knowing how um how well she had done with that you know we really were looking for something where we weren't going to be stuck in a hospital with you know just all the things that come with the procedure style model of birthing and um hold it as a true ceremony you know so we found a midwife out here who's been doing it for 40 years, absolutely incredible. She had a team of, of um, three other women with her. And, um, you know, it was, it was, it was awesome. She got in a full squat mm-hmm. by the bed, Native American style. I had my hands right underneath her and oh my God. Out, out she came. So I can't believe it. 4.36 a.m., uh, 4th of July with a full moon. So, of wow. course, of course, little wolf's going to come on a full moon. But yeah, it was, it was special, really special. Well, congratulations. That's, that's a big deal. It's very, very exciting. I mean, you've had many changes in your life. I'm sure we've all gone through a lot of changes as of late, but for you, it's been probably that's, I'm assuming it's taken over. You got to have, uh, I, I, I feel weird about myself stepping into our future. And I think it's like amazing the people I see raising kids into the next generations coming after us because they they got a a strong road in front of them that they're facing. Is that did that come up for you as a father, or are you just kind of like, yeah. no, we're this is exactly why we should be doing it. It it came up a lot for for my my wife Natasha. You know, like she was thinking about that. We have been trying since 2016, and um, she took her time coming here. You know, I've I've mm-hmm. had many, many connections to her via uh, ayahuasca and other plant medicines where I was able to communicate with her soul. We knew it was a girl um, four years ahead of time, just like we knew Bear was coming first. 
And, um, you know, feeling into that, like, why is she coming right now? Why did she wait until we're smack dab in the middle of chaos? Um, it re <laughs> really just, it allowed me to just be reminded of that. Like there is like where the stars are, where, and I'm not into cosmology. I'm just scratching the tip of the iceberg with it, but a visceral understanding through the plants that, that all that does matter. And that um, we do pick our parents, we choose when we come, we choose, select the body that we're going to take. And really, that really resonated when she showed up, when she did and how she did. You know, and just knowing that that everything we create of all those things, nothing could be more important than the seeds we plant for the future. You know, it, it mm -hmm. reminds me of the Khalil LeBron, the prophet. Have you read that book? Oh, I know it. And if I had, if I did, it was a long time ago. I don't remember. Yeah, but he, he has a beautiful poem on children, you know, and it's basically that we can't, we can't step into the future, but we are the archers. And as we, as we set our bow, we shoot the arrow of our children into the future. So it's, it's how we cast them out that gives them the best opportunity and the best opportunity for the world, you know, as, as members of the sacred hoop. And I really feel into that, um, a great importance in how we teach them, how we educate them, how we keep them connected to the earth. And uh, as much of the uh, traditional teachings that I can get a hold of, you know, to, to really show them through experience so they can have that, that information for them firsthand and really have a deep resonance with, with the way we used to be, you know, all, all of the, um, all of the inherent wisdom that is being forgotten, you know, to, to really remember that and lean into that and carry that going forward. Without yeah. the disconnect. Are you, you're in Austin? Yeah. So, I mean, what, how are you going to instill the lost knowledge? Is it just about like having your kids be more natural rhythms, being outside or is it, do you have an approach for that? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a, there's many ways, right? And so one of yeah. them is through education. And I think Rudolf Steiner had it really well when he, when he, he came up with the Waldorf program, mm -hmm. um, just really looking into kids and different different stages and not trying to keep up with comparison and testing and things like that. Obviously they have to meet national standards and everything like that, but music and language are such a, a big part of the Waldorf program and interaction, you know, in kindergarten, they're not even first grade, they're not being force fed different curriculums and things like that. A lot of it is about play and how they learn how to be a member of society, how they learn how to make friends, how they learn how to interact with one another, how they learn what nature is, and really dialing them into the songs that celebrate the changing of the seasons. So there, there is a connection to nature. They understand, oh, this is a different time of year, and let's celebrate that and really lean into it. So they're paying attention to that more, you know, and they're outside more. And um, that's that's one one critical aspect. Of course, then there are rites of passage, you know, and, and there's a, a yeah. variety of ways we can go through that, you know, whether it's a traditional vision quest and, um, you know, Ben Greenfield and, and a number of other people hooked me up with a good friend of mine, Tim Corcoran, who lived with the Navajo for six months. And he's been working with uh, several elders in different communities like Gilbert Walking Bull and people like that getting dialed in on how we connect back to nature. And the OG vision quest is one of the coolest ways because it'll always be legal, right? No one can take that from you. Uh, well, 40, for, yeah, for now, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Now. Someone might be child endangerment or, or something like that, but yeah, you're right. Well, in any, of these, in any of these things, you know, um, I mean, shit, dude. CPS is, is, is one arm of the medical mafia, in my opinion, in, in many cases. Obviously, there's good work being done there when it comes to abuse and things like that. But, you know, as with anything in life, and um, you know this through the ceremony work, everything takes consent, you know, that I can have an idea of when these stages and things like that should happen. Um, but for the most part, they're, you know, it's going to take their willingness and their want and their desire to go through that walk. And, um, and we'll both know, you know, we'll, we'll know when that time is right. But at different stages, you know, the first thing is a connection to food. And so there's, um, Rome Ranch does regenerative agriculture with the buffalo, and they've, they're bringing back uh, buffalo into Texas, you know, which was, was part of the roaming grounds of 60 million buffalo mm -hmm. before they were over hundred for their skins. And, you know, it's, it's really important. We understand how we get our food. If you're going to eat meat, like you got to know where it comes from and you have to have a connection to that animal. And so we went out and we did a seven directions prayer with tobacco and bear sat on my lap as a four-year-old and watched a buffalo get shot at 20 yards. 
you know, and we prayed for the animal. He watched me clean the animal and we've honored it by having its skull on our altar. And we have a buffalo robe and it's literally the meat that built my daughter's body. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and it, it is building bear's body and it, and it fed my mother, you know, their mother, my wife throughout her second pregnancy. So when you think about that, this animal is not only caring and living through us, but to honor it in that way. I mean, we, after the prayer we made, it walked through the herd of 60 other buffalo and presented itself for us right in front of our faces. And hmm. bear, bear wasn't shocked. He wasn't upset. You know, he he leaned over and touched it and, and and said, thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you for your body. And um, that's, you know, in, in the act of sacred hunts, even though this was a harvest, not a hunt, that's really how you want it. You know, you don't want it to be something where you're going to go take more than you need. And, and um, you know, those are, there are many little lessons that go along with that. And then even just the stillness of hunting. So... I know those are going to be big steps for bear when he's, when the time is right and for wolf and, and at other points, um, you know, some of the deeper work, you know, leaving with, uh, with some aunties and uncles out to the Amazon will be a part of the equation. Um, <laughs> and I'll leave it like for that. And just in case CPS is listening, you know, but, that's uh, awesome. Man. I, I never <laughs> had you know, intentional rites of passage growing up, looking back, but what I, I think the rites of pa- passage that I ended up having, having were, forms of depression and sort of cataclysmic events in my life, whether it was like being a part of 9-11 and then the, the depression that ensued. And it, like the, essentially the edges you find in your own life and your consciousness. And I wonder how that might have helped me if I had had something that was more ritualistic and intended before that. So I knew what those edges were. I had strengthened my muscles in a way, or, or I even had just sort of a witnessing of my own community or family guiding me through that as opposed to feeling adrift. As many people do, they feel very separate and adrift in the world, which can make you feel it's a rough go. You know, it's a rough, it's a rough go. And the world we're walking into is nutty. Um, but here's here's a question just to segue a little bit. Uh, we When I was on your podcast, you have a great podcast, you were talking about a journey you had taken where I think you took 30 grams of mushrooms uh, which my listeners out there, it's not something that you recommend or that I would recommend, but you did it. You're alive. And uh, I'm curious since then how that's settled in for you or if you've touched on any other psychedelic frontiers you might want to relate to us as perhaps how it relates to everything that's going on, this great transition that we find ourselves in. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's look, just and just to touch on what you were talking about, I think life delivers us our own initiations just because our society has stripped that away That's from us. Sure. We, we, uh, <laughs> they come. They, yeah. <laughs> we, we get to show up in different ways in our, our teaching. You know, as Paul Check talks about, the pain teacher shows up in many different forms, first as a whisper, then as a knock at the door, and then it'll kick our door down. And that can be a car accident or a twisted ankle or the loss yeah. of a loved one. It can be many different ways that we get those teachings. But it's all, it's really about tools, you know, and, and psychedelics and plant medicines for me have been incredible tools in my journey. They helped me transition from being a professional fighter. And, um, you know, I went through my own bouts of depression. I attempted my own suicide when football ended at ASU. Uh, thankfully I'm still here, but wow, it's been, it's been a hell of a path. And, uh, you know, as I've worked with medicines with respect and reverence and with different high level teachers, uh, I've come to the place where, you know, I just, I felt like I had some equivalency and could go a bit deeper. And um, I had a friend of mine send me some videos from Kalindi Ai, who recently passed away. And he's known as the 20 to 30 gram guy. You know, and my first reaction yeah. was probably like you. I was like, mm, this guy's a quack. <laughs> no one takes that much. <laughs> and uh, I watched him and I realized he was fairly grounded. You know, for somebody who had been doing that for 20 years, a lot more grounded than a lot of people I've met in ayahuasca circles. And, um, really what was resonating is I felt like I was getting permission. And uh, mm. ayahuasca in different journeys when I had asked, you know, like, how do I continue to work with you or work at a level this deep when I can't make it back to the Amazon? I was shown a golden mushroom growing and uh, different numbers of the doses of progression to climb that ladder. <laughs> so when I had the opportunity after seeing that, I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And um you know, as you know, on my podcast, we talked a bit about that. 
I've had some rough experiences, you know, and I, and, you know, like Dennis McKenna or, or any of the greats, I don't believe there is a such thing as a bad trip. There are challenging and hard moments within the trip, but um, no bad trips and all, all this is perspective. But if there was a bad trip, that would, that would certainly <laughs> stand up to, to anything I've experienced. You know, I, I spent what I can only describe as eternity in hell. And the only way through that was truly surrendering like actually not caring of what I was seeing and being okay with it and accepting it before I could move on to the wow. next layer. And that happened for what felt like eternity. You know, there's no time really, even on a couple of grams, time is distorted. So on 30, you know, it's, it's, there's zero concept of time. I was out of my body the entire experience. Um, and to go through that, I mean, really what the, the lessons were in that was it was a report card. Anything I have aversion to, anything I'm clinging to, um, any fears that I had were shown in the most visceral, visceral possible way. You know, I mean, it was a lived experience of seeing my worst nightmare come to fruition. And, um, you know, really gruesome and detailed, you know, bloody at times and, and um, uh, incredibly challenging. And then, you know, in the wake of that, I thought I was dead for a solid 30 minutes. You know, I just, I really had, had not pieced it back together yet. And then slowly started to come back to my body and realizing I was alive. You know, rebirth was the last intention I had written down. And even though I've had the death, death experience on 5-MeO and on ayahuasca, like nothing quite compares to that. So it's, uh, it took me some time to unpack it, but Initially, I thought never again, and now I know that I will do it again. I mean, it's it's been over a year since I've done wow. it, um, yeah. and I haven't done it. I haven't done another one since. But uh, a very clear um, intuition on that was to really work with a high level black belt as a grounding cord in my next experience. You know, I would never pour ayahuasca for myself, and Ikoros guide that. So, really working with somebody who can who can tune into me and tune into the medicine and feel into where I'm at and whether it's with tobacco smoke or song itself, guide me through that experience with a little bit more grace. Um, I think, I think I will reenter that land, you know, when, when the stars align and the time is right. And I, I certainly feel called to it. And at the same time, you know, as we, as you brought up on our podcast, there's, there's so much that can be accomplished in, in, uh, thinking outside the box and shifting our perspective with far less, you know, and mm -hmm. I had, um, my first meditative dose with the Sonoran Desert Toad, 5-MeO-DMT. And like a little kid, you know, I was like, all right, cool. Once we do that, I get to go deep, right? You know, and, and uh, really just just like a little kid. And um, with the meditative dose, I had so many downloads. I felt like when Neo You mean gets like plugged, a, a lighter dose? Yeah, meditative, very light. I mean, yeah. I don't know if there yeah. is such a thing as, as a light dose with 5-MeO-DMT, but right. it was... Uh, it was like I had a zip file installed into my brain. And then I spent the next 30 minutes unpacking everything that I got in less than one second. I mean, it was instantaneous. And then I got to retrace and go over and go back over everything that had come in. And um, I've never experienced anything like that. So truly, I'm, I'm still learning how to work with all these different medicines. And, you know, I've, I've, probably done, you know, psilocybin over a hundred times and ayahuasca 26 times now and somewhere in the, in the high teens with 5-MeO and I'm just continuing to learn. You know, I feel like I have equivalency, but I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty green, you know, in, in terms of, you know, that, that never ending unfolding well of information that lies within these things. And that, that yeah, feels well, pretty good too. If you had, if you were to say right now, like, I think I got a handle on this and I figured it out. <laughs> And then you're like, I'm about to dive back in. I would say, don't. <laughs> you're about to go to SmackDown. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so yeah. it seems like you've got the right energy. It's an endless well and an endless experience. Uh, do you think that, uh, and perhaps this is my own projection from starting to meet you guys and some people in your your circles with Aubrey and other people, but are you sensing that some of the bros out there are starting to awaken into forms of more consciousness and awareness and introspection or is that just me oh you mean like the guys that have a physical meat suit like me like getting yeah getting the, the it, bros yeah, yeah like yeah, uh, 100, 100%. I, a, I mean i know i know several but i'm just curious if there's if it's a larger 
uh, wave happening. And it's, do you think psychedelics plays a role in that or it's, it's just sort of something else? I think so. I mean, I, I mean, I think, I think psychedelics play a role in that. And I think in part you have guys like Joe Rogan and Aubrey Marcus that are, you know, like if, if you, if you look out into somebody, um, and you see a little bit of yourself in them and they're speaking to you in a way that resonates, you know, Kalindi resonated with me cause he's a lifelong mar- martial artist, he you know, was. it was like, he was, and it was like, Oh, huh. Wow. And he has this wealth of knowledge on the history of African psychedelics and the fact that these, you know, continents used to be right next to each other and how they mirrored and, and a wealth of knowledge on the indigenous cultures that lived there from the Maasai to um, the Sunni and many others. And it's like, oh, this is this is uh, this is a really cool you know, thing here where I, I feel like he's speaking to me. And I think that resonates with a lot of people because Rogan is down to earth and he does yeah, yeah. take care of himself. And he, you know, he's a hunter and he's a lot of things. And Aubrey obviously walks the walk with his body. And, um, I think more bros might resonate with that person than, you know, a, a hippie with a beard down to his knees. And then at the same time, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why I like to have a lot of different people on the podcast, because if I'm just having bros on and what, no matter what, where they are on the spectrum, <laughs> sometimes you want to hear it from a woman. Sometimes you want to hear it from an old man. Sometimes you want to hear it from a young woman. Sometimes you want to hear it from anything in between. And the more ways in which we can communicate with one another effectively, the easier that message gets through. And from there, people become more open to the experience of whether it's, you know, four days without food or water or, you know, six days in the darkness like Aubrey had done or float tanks or breath work, you know, any of these things that can help shift us and create an altered state of consciousness. There's many tools in the tool bag. So um, let's experiment and see what's right for us. And I think people are starting to open up to that and understand that there are legal avenues to go and there are some gray areas to go and there are some outright illegal avenues to go. But no matter what we choose, it is really important that we begin to just move this, this, these, this vision that can get so congested and so narrow in our thinking through the repeated patterns of our own experience, through the repeated patterns of what we see on social media, which is designed that way totally. to start to widen our lens. And, and from there, really look into our shadow and heal some stuff and then just be an explorer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe it's indicative of like a larger shift happening with people in general, uh, the guy, Court Johnson, who speaks the 10 laws in one of my songs, one thing that he says is that we're crossing this kind of bell curve on the planet. And it's sort of from young souls, you know, more now into uh, adolescent to mature souls. And in that transition, one of the main characteristics of that is that people are becoming more introspective. They introspect. And just as opposed to an outward view of all of life, they tend to start to look inward and that being a very profound shift for people. And we certainly see that in many different fields, whether it's uh, yoga expanding or what we're talking about right now or organic foods, everything, the psychedelic movement. And it seems fitting for the times too. You know, it seems like it's a sign of the times or a symptom of the times, but it's sort of like a yin yang where one goes with the other. As things are collapsing, hopefully people are starting to see these doorways of opportunity in front of themselves and rise up. So for yourself, as you've been walking through this particularly uh, pointed time the last six, seven, eight months, what's what's been coming up for you? Like, what's your edge that you feel like you're working with as a point of transition? Right. Well, I mean, I've, I've been... Uh... I've been trying not to put my head in the sand like an ostrich. I'm trying to really see it on all sides. Um, I think the cracks, you know, it's exposing all the cracks. This, this, yes. this global pressure is exposing all the cracks we have, everything that's broken from our financial systems to our education all the way up to university, um, our food, you know, how we depend on big energy and power companies and big oil, uh, all of this really is being shown to us. And, and if, if the world is where it is, you know, I've, I've read <laughs> the new confessions of an economic hitman that will blow some people's minds. You know, it really dives into corporatocracy and how a lot of these sort of little countries that I've been to have been overtaken from the U S and economic hitman and big oil companies. And yeah. those are hard pills to swallow, you know? And, and then at the same time, we have this equal and opposite force of good coming through. And we see that with all these major universities. You know, I had a couple friends um, 
help out with the $17 million psychedelic wing that's at John Hopkins. And you, oh. you see people with big money now showing up because they've, they've had first-hand experience with these things and understand their value. And at the same time, like you said, there's a lot more organic farming. We see uh, movies, you know, documentaries like The Biggest Little Farm and Kiss the Ground and this connection back to the earth. And then the, the, the beautiful thing about that too is how fast nature responds you know, with intention, when we have reverence and we're trying to create ecosystems, it's much more rapid than soil scientists ever thought we could restore the mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm paying attention to both things, but at the same time, I think it's where we focus. And, and for the longest time through media and social media, we have focused on the bad because that's what sells. And that's what, you know, Joe Dispenza actually said this once in a, in a meditation that blew me away, how we, and it's in Becoming Supernatural, uh, one of my favorite books of his, but we can become addicted to anger. We can become addicted to fear. We can become addicted to negative emotions. And right. on paper, I mean, my first thought is, what are you talking about? No one would want more fear, more anger. But the truth is, if you are in a mundane you know, jail cell <laughs> job that you can't stand with long commutes, whatever makes you feel alive is going to be addictive. And if fight or flight kicks on every time you get into an argument with your wife or every time, uh, you know, your boss shits on you or whatever the case is, that can start to become a knee jerk shift that, that you, that does resonate for you because it makes you feel alive. And looking at that in my own life, it was like, yeah, I am addicted to feeling angry. I am addicted to mm. conflict. And, you know, I, I look at my trajectory as an athlete from football to fighting. It's like, okay, there, yeah, that's not, that's not a, uh, that's not a lo too lofty to, to connect those dots, but how we unpack that, whether it's through plant medicines, breath work, meditation, any of these other things is really important because then we can start to find for ourselves, what is it that really lights me up inside? And what is it that I'm actually trying to accomplish? And what are the steps I'm going to take to do that? And what are the, what is this deep feeling of peace that I can feel at moments in plant medicines, but I maybe don't live with in between the journeys. And, um, for me, it's in that reflection that I can start to refine and really work backwards to know that if I'm in a state that used to be previously really addicting because it made me feel alive, how can I work with that in a different way? You know, if you get in an ice bath, that's going to switch on some fight or flight. It's also going to bring a lot of stillness in. But those, those neurochemicals and hormones that happen from that are good for the immune system. They're good for the brain. They're good for a lot of things when it's acute and it's not chronic. So how do I play with that stuff acutely and start to work away from the chronic, repetitive, negative behaviors that I've had and been addicted to? And then at the same time, build more of a chronic positive outlook on life. And, and that really has to do with where I put my attention. You know, it has to do mm -hmm. with the focal point. And, um, you know, my wife had the download to get rid of our TV, I think three or four years ago in psilocybin. And uh, Bear was really young, totally addicted to it. You know, like he would watch maybe 30 minutes a day and there'd be an mm -hmm. argument every time he walked by the TV. So yeah, we just got rid like, of it. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> we just, we just got rid of it. And, um, we'll still watch documentaries and things like that on the computer, but, um, it's just not a draw, you know, with that gone and without having cable and, you know, people are like, how do you get the news? How do you get this? How do you get that? It's like, well, I'm plugged in. I, I yeah, got a lot got of friends. Phones. <laughs> but, yeah, like we, we knew about COVID right when it happened, just like everyone else. I don't have to tune into the news. Um, you know, so really just looking at that, like what, what are we going to build going forward that actually matters? What are we going to, how are we going to change in ways that actually matter? Because no one's here to save us. It's us that's going to save us. And so I've really been looking a lot into regenerative agriculture, conscious communities, planned communities, um, on-site education, Waldorf style, Montessori style, just a variety of things that we can do that are not just for our kids, but are for us right now in, um, rethinking and reimagining you know, the world. And there's some really awesome people out there like Charles Eisenstein. He wrote The More mm -hmm. Beautiful World Our Hearts Know as Possible and, um, and several other great books. So it's just being connected to different people like that and um, actually starting to ground that from the, the astral, the etheric, and put our feet on the ground and, and start literally planting seeds that change, change the scope of how we move forward. No doubt. Charles is, Charles is great. He's one of my teachers, met him uh, way back in 2008. That's actually 
he's kind of the reason that I'm now down in Boulder, Utah, because I'd read his second book, The Ascent of Humanity, and it was really powerful for me. And he was part of this little retreat happening at the Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch. It was him, Dan, Daniel Pinchbeck, and Dennis McKenna. And, I, and it was oh, wow. like basically talks and hiking in the canyons. I, that was pretty much it. I was like, I was in New York City at the time. I was like, I'm in. That's that's a win for me. And it was quite inexpensive. And there were probably just 30 people there. And it was it was really profound. And how was can I ask, how was Daniel Pinchbeck? Back then or now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Kind of the same. Yeah. I mean, I've known I I so I lived in New York and I knew Daniel from that scene. And I got to know this was right when Evolver started. I don't know if you remember Evolver. It was like a conscious social network they started. So Reality Sandwich was their online magazine that was about counterculture stuff and psychedelics and aliens and all these things that no one else would write about. And this is 2008, frankly, psychedelics weren't as very popular. Like it was still a pariah to write about them. So it was a place that I had found online where I could read about this stuff. And he was one of the founders with four other, three other people. And when I went and met these guys, because we were all in New York, uh, we all became friends. I became closer friends with uh, some of the other guys, particularly Michael Robinson. But Daniel was someone who was just like a tough egg to crack, you know, like, I don't know what it was like. I, a lot of times when we were talking, he'd be looking over my shoulder or looking around the room kind of thing, you know? And I was just like, I don't know. I didn't really felt seen in that way, but we had some, we had some good times together. And he's, he's been a good guy to me, but I don't know him that well. Mm. And uh, we, I knew him over the years through that. And then we kind of fell out of touch when I left out of New York. Um, but I really went for Charles and Dennis. Yeah. I was a big Terrence McKenna fan, particularly at the time. I had oh, yeah. listened to many, many, many talks on Psychedelic Salon. And so I was like, oh my God, it's Dennis McKenna. This is the shit. I think I told you the story about how when we were there, this is before like I had led any ceremony, before East Forest, all this stuff. I was all this kind of starting to open up. And we had done uh, some mushrooms on the last night there. and having this great time, but one of the guys there wanted to have his first journey. And so we gave him some mushrooms, not a whole lot. And he went down a deep, 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 dark, dark hole. Just started by himself. We kept trying to corral him and bring him back. And he kept just going further and further. And I found him. <laughs> I w and I was trying to, I felt a little bit of responsibility, right? Because so I was like, where is he? And someone's like, I think he went in the, the ranch house. I went in there. I found him like in the kitchen by himself, just like sitting at a table. And he looks at me when I walk in, he says, I am God. And I said, <laughs> yes, we're all God. <laughs> Wonderful. And I sat down with him and he's just like, you know, his eyes are completely dilated. And and this, uh, this girl walks in who was uh, there at the retreat and he went up to her. He was mesmerized and he started grabbing her. And so I'm trying to like, Okay, now we've crossed the line. I was like, okay, we, that's not okay. And so I pulled him from her, off her around the corner into the bathroom, put him, dro threw him into the shower and turned on the water. And it's cold water hits him. He's just like completely stunned for a minute. And he proceeded to be in the shower for all night. So another like eight hours. It took three of us to hold him down as he was like speaking in tongues and like screaming and flailing, just going in and out of just like, complete like other worldly stuff. I'd never at that point, I'd never witnessed anything like this. And it really threw me and he got through it, of course, but it was just a long night. And, uh, the next day I was like, someone suggested we should probably talk to Dennis because he's, he's the dude and he's just, he's here. So let's go. Okay. So we walk up to Dennis. Hey, um, so this is what happened. He took some mushrooms for the first time. He was speaking in tongues. We all had to hold him down. Um, it was, it was very, very strong medicine for him. And Dennis is listening. And he tells the whole story f from the guy who was telling it now. And he says, well, uh, what's the issue? <laughs> Sounds like a very powerful journey. <laughs> like, yeah. So I think when you're comparing to like going down to uh, the Amazon and losing your mind for weeks on end, 
Um, but I was also reminded because when that did happen, one of my friends there who owns the place was like, you know, this is a, this is a beautiful opportunity. Like we should light all these candles and all these things. So when he comes out, it's like a rebirth. And it's like, cause he, he recognized what he was going through. And uh, it was a very powerful experience. But Daniel was there too. I don't know where he was that night. I don't remember. I just remember holding this guy down in the bathtub all night long with my Navy SEAL friend and the two of us being totally <laughs> battle scarred after that night. But anyway, uh, that's why I ended up moving there because I I went there for the first time and I never would have gone down there. And then I, I fell in love with the area and kept going back. And now I have a, a spot down there. So it's been a journey. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I don't know why we got on that whole thing, but, um, well, we're Eisenstein first. And, uh, yeah, it's funny. The reason I brought up Pinchback was because I, I've absolutely loved some of his books and I, I met him at Burning Man, I think two years ago, he was giving a talk in the pyramid, which is where we were staying. And I, I had signed up to volunteer to clean up after people and, and help usher them in, find them seats, make sure everyone could hear, uh, and all that good stuff. And, Daniel was speaking with somebody who was there to talk about conscious communities and different plant communities he had worked with in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of had equal time on the mics, but uh, at some point, Daniel just went off and he, he was, you know, yeah, he cursing at everyone. He's like, oh, you fucking people flying in here <laughs> on your fucking commercial airplanes, on your fucking private jet to get to Burning Man, and, and you're dancing each night. And I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be well received. I was dancing last night. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I think yeah, um, yeah, that can happen. That can happen. Yeah, uh, it, it's it stuck with me. I think because we live in such a polarized time, you know, and and with that, I think one of the critical pieces is is in the way we communicate, and it's in the way we communicate with ourselves first, you know, the inner critic, and then it's in the way that we communicate to one another. And uh, one of the one of the deeper downloads that I've come to understand the, the old. Um, cliche thing. You can only love someone else as much as you love yourself. Um, I've come to see that you can only have as much compassion for someone else as you do for yourself. So if your own inner critic is on fire and constantly beating your own ass, you're not going to have, you know, any level of compassion and empathy for another. And, um, that's, that's what was resonating with me when he, when he went off the handle. Yeah. You got to have that compassion. Uh, Look, his one of his first books, maybe his first book, Breaking Open the Head, mm -hmm. was it broke open my head. And in the back of it, it had the thing about reality sandwich. I mean, it really was the gateway drug for me that opened me up into everything. I mean, frankly, I met my partner I have now because of that, if, if I connect the dots. So I owe him I owe him a lot on that level. <laughs> Some of those books are really powerful for me. Um, but Things have, things have shifted over the years in this whole scene. And I've noticed that the psychedelic science and the psychedelic wave that's happening is is certainly wonderful. I mean, as we speak, this will air after this happens. So I'm not sure how it'll pan out, but like psilocybin is on the ballot in Oregon as, as, as well as um, decriminalizing a lot of hard drugs there. There's some really amazing things happening and everything else that you know about and the listeners know about with the research. But we're also getting it now into this field of like, it's a double-edged sword. And you've, and you've got a lot of power grabs and, and some questions about like what direction we go with and the commercialization of it. And, the, and then we've already seen that with like the yoga community. Um, are you worried about any of that or, or what have your thoughts been on it? Yeah, and just like uh, the way I have, I've come to understand it, and I'm sure you've brought it up on this podcast before, is that these teacher plants hold their own consciousness. You know, mm -hmm. ayahuasca itself is its own consciousness and uh, a highly intelligent one at that, you know, a deep level of awareness. And when you standardize these things as synthetics, I'm not sure it holds the same level of consciousness. Um, it's not to say that we shouldn't study it for sure, but, you know, I, I was in California and voted through the bill to legalize cannabis. And a lot mm -hmm. of the complaints I got from the organic farmers was this is all for big business. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in California's government now, you look at that with, with Newsom and all the people in charge there, they were right. There's no question. There's no question that was the case. So so there is some worry, and it is a double-edged sword. Um, I don't think for one second that even with prescription psilocybin or prescription DMT or whatever this looks like down the road, that the organics are going away. And 
I feel like the more science that's done, the more permission is given. You know, you look at like a guy like Michael Pollan, How to Change Your Mind. I thought it was, you know, a review of a lot of things I already knew, but highly palpable for people that had never heard about these plants. Yeah, you know, highly it was a palpable. Big deal. Yeah, and from coming from his standpoint as somebody who never really spoke about it, to now really go deep down the rabbit hole and and see how that's unfolded in his life. And so the more of these types of things that we have that, that bring into people's awareness, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a win. And at the same time, you know, as I feel into the future, you're not going to replace the Amazon. You know, we could destroy it. That's certainly a possibility <laughs> and that's an issue. Yeah. But you're not going to replace curanderos and curanderos that have been, you know, grandfathered into this, these medicine practices from five years old on. You know, like they're just, mm-hmm. that, that lineage is too long. And there's too much knowledge and wisdom on how to work with these plants there. And, and the same goes for, you know, even just the, the the organic psilocybin species and things like that. Like, yeah, it's probably not going to contain the same lineage in terms of how that's guided, but it's, it is going to hold a different resonance, in my opinion, than some of the synthetics. And I think for for the true psychonaut, that's always there's always going to be demand for that. And as long as there's demand for that, people are going to grow them and we'll have access. I think Ram Dass's first journey with psilocybin or any psychedelic was a synthetic because he talked about um, when he's with Tim Leary and Allen Ginsberg and he was given some psilocybin and I think it, it was, maybe it was made by Sandoz and they were using it for their studies or something. But he, he, he accounts that for starting him on his entire spiritual journey, which is a huge statement. Yeah. For, honestly, for me too, like some, the very first psychedelic experience I had was on psilocybin and it was very, very profound. It's confusing, but it was a fuse was lit of like, what was that thing that happened that felt realer than real? Um, and that, so I maybe we don't know. We don't know if like it's synthesized or not, if that has the same magic. And I agree there well, will always I, be I an interest that, in the whole thing. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off or jump in. I, I mean, I mean that from a model, like the synthetic, like I, I think ketamine is, is if there's a, if there's a <laughs> psychedelic round table, I put ketamine at that table amongst ayahuasca, Sonoran desert toad, yeah. all these things. I mean, ketamine is fully synthetic. Uh, it might be in a plant on another planet, but not on ours. Uh, at least LSD <laughs> is found in ergot and things like that in the LSD mysteries. <laughs> but, but, you know, when we're working with these own tools that open us up, if we have those bridges built, the way I understand it is, if I if I have a bridge with ayahuasca, if I have a bridge with psilocybin, ket- ketamine can tune me into any one of those access points, especially if ikaros are being sung, and things like that. And um, it's a phenomenal tool. And what's what makes that great is that there's such a low barrier to entry. Mm-hmm. You know, ketamine, you can have ketamine on an SSRI, and not only will it work, and not only will you not die, but your experience might not even be diminished. Whereas psilocybin. You won't die, but it's not going to work as well as if you or were MDMA. not on SSRIs. MDMA, yeah. right? Um, ayahuasca, you could die if you're on SSRIs. So when we look at a population that's incredibly depressed and knows something's wrong, but doesn't know exactly what it is, um, we have to have things like that. We have to have low-hanging fruit for people to get a hold of. I guess the piece that I was going at with the medicalization of this is, does it look like some of these ketamine centers where you go in, you get a shot from a guy in a white lab coat, and then they send you on your way afterwards while they played some shitty classical music. You know, I mean, that's that's why you came out with music for mushrooms, right? This kind of happened to me, actually, at a ketamine clinic. I mean, but I agree it, with you. Yeah, it's not it's the like, move, you know? And, yeah. and and there are, we're, we're going to see more, you know, thanks to Rick Doblin and his view of the future uh, on what these healing centers will look like. There's one that's opening up right down the street from on it, same building here in Austin. Uh, it's going to be called Kuya. It opens in 2021. Dr. Dan Engel, who spent a year and a half in the Amazon working with ayahuasca and, and dieting with many different plants, he's going to head that. And he's a licensed psychotherapist and psychiatrist. So it's going to be full spectrum and everything from epigenetic testing to blood work and and full health panels done in addition to ketamine, in addition to float tanks, in addition to hot and cold therapy, it's going to be full, the the full expression of what it means to go somewhere and actually have healing, you know, on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And I see that model going forward too. The the thing I mean about, you know, the the synthetics and and big business, big pharma getting a hold of it is just, is this just, you know, going to be a cookie cutter 
I got my prescription from my doctor and there's no real support around that because as you know, integration and, yeah. and preparation are as important as it gets. Yeah. It's, you could argue that it's everything and the container that it's done in the ceremony itself is a big, big part of what it is. And, and the music's a big part of what that ceremony is. My, my ketamine experience with the intermuscular, the shot was like mm -hmm. that, like the guy was sort of in a hurry and just kind of like, Hey, I just need it. I need it. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, bro, we haven't even started yet. You know? And I am just trying to like, I'm just arriving and he put it in my arm and he just left. And, uh, I was there in a little group session, but I didn't really, it just, it just came on like a freight train that was fueled by a nuclear power plant. And like, <laughs> I mean, it was like nothing else I had ever experienced in my life. And I've had, I've been around the block and like, this was, this was way, way, way beyond in power. And I, I haven't had five MEO, but I thought like, oh, this must be what five MEO is like, because it just was this infinite, uh, ascension. It just never stopped. <laughs> Yeah, Going there's, there's the, definitely similarities it, for sure. <laughs> dimensional areas that I didn't know those dimensions were dimensions or those concepts just kept going. And and that was, I, w I don't want to say it was good or bad. It was just powerful, incredibly fast too. It wasn't this slow moving thing. It was just like, just kept going. And um, and this was just some some guy who just walks in a room and just kind of sticks something in your arm and takes off, you know, because he's got to go home to dinner. And something about that felt violent, right? It felt like that's, that's not how this, this we're holding people's souls in a way that's incredibly vulnerable and we need to add that care around it. And that, that ceremony, that ritual, that container is a, a, a massive part of the experience. And it's not going to be held within the medicalization model completely, but I hope that it's something that's available to people also who don't necessarily have the money to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for some of these retreats and experiences. I mean, it'd be amazing if it was just sort of like more holistic was if health was available like this as part of, for all of us, if it, if we felt called or we wanted to explore it and some kind of like um, Medicare for all as part of Medicare, it'd be amazing. Or you had this like chunk of money you could use how you want. And it was like a credit system, I don't know, Whatever it is, the policy, uh, I would love to see it be more democratized and egalitarian for everyone to use. Yeah, and I think availability is heading in that direction. You know, the access points, um, how we access it, and I think as consciousness moves and lifts, and and you know that that equal and opposite force of all the darkness we see being the light side. Um, there's a lot more people carrying medicine with respect and re reverence these days, and. Um, yeah. You know, certainly the doctors that I've worked with, they hold it in that way with respect. I mean, we 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 held our ketamine injections in our hand with our intention yeah. to our heart and verbalized them, spoke them into existence first in front of the entire group before we handed it back to be injected. You know, there was there was a lot of reverence with that. And um Palo Santo and tobacco and and pretty much, you know, organized it in a way that was no different than a plant medicine ceremony. And and with yeah. that level of intention you know, our, our, we were received by the medicine and the medicine was received by us in a way that, that made it indistinguishable from, you know, uh, a curated plant medicine journey with a high level practitioner. Yeah. It, it, I had no idea ketamine could, could be that powerful and that profound. I think I just had complete ignorance about that. And, um, now I have a, a fully different viewpoint. It's, it's some space medicine, man. Like it, it can take you places. There, it had elements of LSD, psilocybin, DMT, MDMA, and nitrous all combined into one. Like it had the clothing of all of them. <laughs> I was just like, "What is this? What is happening right now?" I'm, I, I maybe it's just a shock. As, as Terrence <laughs> McKenna said, it's like you know, you, if you, you won't die from a DMT trip, except maybe in, you'll die of awe. Or, you know, yeah, <laughs> don't die to the astonishment. <laughs> the dive astonishment, right? Yeah, <laughs> I haven't listened to him in so long. With her, so many like fun quotes. I remember him talking about all a sitter needs to do is essentially be someone. They could be in another part of the house, and just every now and then, maybe you ring a bell or something, and they just pop their head in and just be like, "It's all cool," and <laughs> they, just, they just leave again, and like that's, you know, do the least amount that they need to do. Yeah, well. 
it's amazing, Matt. I'm glad to see that you're thriving and it seems like you're walking through what is a uh, already a challenging time and then you're bringing like, as beautiful as it is, I know it's stressful too when you bring a new life into the world. And I hope that you guys and your family are, are walking through that with uh, as the least amount of stress as you can. Is the relationship feeling feeling good through things like this? I mean, you've done it before. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. It's been it's been a it's been a catalyst for growth. There's no question. You know, you have a, a various fires lit under your ass that that you can look away from or you can say yes to. You know, and, and thankfully through the deeper journeys and the, my trajectory, I, I know always that the the fastest way through the storm is head on. You know, and really facing and looking at the things as they present themselves, and continuing to learn. You know, like that that's just been. There's always something that steers me in a direction. And if I listen to that steering and that intuition, then I'm guided to the right place. And whatever it's been, whether it's through how to communicate differently with Tosh or how to parent differently and, and feeling into that. And then the stillness as the greatest teacher, you know, stillness and nature, that combination um, is a great vantage point to reset myself and to really come at whatever challenge I have with, with peace and equanimity. And, uh, you know, we've had our, our challenges, no doubt, but I think this in, in many ways has been another great teaching and bringing a female into our home, you know, the balance, the, the yin to bears young energy has been incredible as well because they're completely different. I mean, all kids are, mm -hmm. but I mean, they are polar opposites and, uh, it's absolutely beautiful having her energy in our home now. I, I bet it is. I bet it is. Yeah, it's such a wild trip. I only have two part-time stepkids, which I always call PTSD, part-time stepdad. And uh, <laughs> even that's like a wild ride for me. And they have a very active, involved dad. But it's giving me a glimpse into this whole journey. And it's it's such a trip, man. It's like the total crucible for spiritual development. There's nothing more than bigger than your relationships, those immediate close relationships with your partner and your family. And uh, it's like, that's where a lot of the real work happens. We can deny that sometimes by thinking it's these other things or these external projects or, or these ideas we have, but the rubber meets the road a lot uh, with ourselves. And then the next level is often our partner, our family. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, the, the, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. I've had that yeah. experience <laughs> yeah. quite a few times in the wake of really transformative week-long ceremonies. You know, we're like, as it happens, <laughs> yeah, I'm going on. Of course on it up. happens that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, mom's staying with us for a week or dad just came to town for three days, you know, and it's it's a really beautiful to look at it that way and then say like, oh, do I actually know this now? Can I be the peace that I wish to be or the peace that I wish for them to embody? Can I actually just be that first rather than try to verbalize it or teach them anything? Can I, can I lead by example? And um those have been difficult, challenging, and and awesome ways of learning at the same time, you know. So I, I welcome all of that. Yeah, no doubt. Well, what are you up to these days? Is there something you want to tell people about, or they can? Are you still doing your own sort of coaching privately? Yeah, yeah. So I have. I mean, we're we're obviously I have the podcast called Kingsbury Podcast. Uh, still working as a coach with Aubrey and Fit for Service, which you came out to last year, I think, at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've been doing that full force this year and it's gone fantastic. You know, uh, there's online applications available at aubreymarcus.com slash fit for service. And we're starting an app now, which is great. So because we have oh. a limit on how many people we have in there at 150, um, for a lot of people that, that can't get in right now or either through financial reasons or simply because the numbers are full, that's a way you can continue to learn from me, Aubrey, Eric Godsey, Caitlin Howe, and many of the other great people that we work with like yourself. So, um, I know Arby's going to reach out to you to, to talk about, you know, uh, some tracks and different things that we can work with Sweet. through the app. And, um, yeah. that's, that's good. That's going to be a lot of fun. And we are really excited about that, that are released, I think in December and, um, and yeah, of course the private coaching is, is going great. You know, I've got only a couple people right now and I've really invested in them and I've seen their trajectory over the last year and it's been been fantastic. So we're, mm -hmm. I'm on, I'm, not, I'm off, I got off all social media and then I jumped onto a joint account with my wife on Instagram just so I could connect with people quickly. Um, and that's at living with the Kingsbury. So if people want to get a hold of me, reach to me there. So did you delete your, I don't know, it's professional pages, so to speak? 
Yeah, all of them. And and honestly, it was Good like, I don't you. know if it was just in it, <laughs> like I was tuning into this madness ahead of time, but uh, I deleted everything in February, you know, pre all this stuff hitting the fan before <laughs> any any real news about, <coughs> excuse me, any any real news about how Google, Facebook, and 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 Twitter were actually operating behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, just feeling into that, it just felt like there's a different way. And then, you know, succumbing in some ways to this is a very quick way to still communicate with people, and and uh, you know, the majority of the world is there. So, why not keep some piece of me available, and um, and then just not tune into it as often as possible. And that's that's worked out really well for me in terms of how I go about my day. I'm not getting lost online anymore. And um, that's brought a great degree of peace as well. I would love to do that uh, for many reasons. And I I feel like I'm building up to it in a sense, but it's, I don't even, I I have someone who helps me manage those pages and it's more just sort of, I I don't know, it's it's sort of the why, you know, the only reason I'm really doing it is because it's a great way to communicate certain things going on with people who are in the community. And even my email list isn't as effective that way. Yeah. Um, But I would like, I would like to feel like I don't need that, you know, but I I fear that I wouldn't be able to tell them about certain things or get, or we couldn't get in touch with each other. You'd be surprised how many people reach out that way. And a lot of messages get lost, but it's like, they don't even think to just like email. They can find Mm -hmm. an email to reach out and they just go through those channels. Like I said, of ease. Yeah, convenience, right? So yeah. we gotta, I got to meet that convenience on some level at least. Yeah. Well, good on you, man. Um, glad to hear that. And it's great to see your uh, your face here and great to hear your voice. And thank you for coming on this this world and sharing a bit about stuff with our community. Hope they dive into yours. Yeah, brother. I miss you big time. It's so good seeing your face again. Yeah, I hope to see you guys soon. Really soon, I hope. Thanks, yeah, brother. Dude. Beautiful. Thank you. Trying to see the brightness in the world, but it's pitch black. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate you joining us. It's always good to uh, get to to see you. Check out his world and particularly his podcast. He's a very busy man in that regard, and there's some other cool stuff about him out there online. So, thanks, Kyle. Hope to hope to see you again. This song you're hearing in the background is called I Can't Breathe, the East Forest Remix by Born Eye. Uh, Born Eye is a Washington, D.C.-based artist. You should check him out. I did this remix for him. He played the Crystal Bowls and did the rapping, and I really like it. So um, it's just a single we put out together earlier this, this year, and this is a bit of it. But if you want to hear it in full, check it out uh, wherever you listen to music. And you can buy it on the eastforest.org website. And I hope to see you in Salt Lake City, January 16th. If you are feeling called to join us, tickets will be on sale this Wednesday, December 16th at eastforest.org slash tour. Okay, guys, thanks for the reviews. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for walking your walk. Thanks for doing your thing. Don't forget to sit down and just take a deep breath every now and then. And uh, don't take any shit, but if you do, do it with grace. The winter fell, then we swing cannons with every moment passing and all of my distractions. Feeling like the life I live is haunted by assassins. Spend the dark night under the heavens, enough to utter the question. Am I alone or am I under protection? The king's iron throne, I alone flying home. Make them down on chrome, black palace, white castle to the sky. I roam, silent forms whispered in a samurai's dream. Granted, I seem battered by the battles I've seen. This is born, I'm music for sages through the unusual ages. Now they never question who is the greatest. What is profit to a man who gained the world and lose his own soul? Foe, foe, when that chrome goat, then it's closed door. After life, there is the reincarnation. King without a crown on some Ichabod crane shit. Swore that I would rep it, though the Soros eyes confess it. They don't really want peace, they just polarize the message. But what's the message? All life is precious. My team will represent it until all eyes respect it. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, and so many others. 
We love you. Bless.